is a therapeutic for patients with chronic liver disease. And I think that that is not something that, um, that the liver community, uh, the liver practitioners have entirely um, uh, messaged and packaged in a very clear way. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, yes, you can change your lifestyle. We're very, we're sort of vague about it as a therapy for patients with chronic liver disease, but it is, a, it is directly beneficial to your liver. Um, in Nutrition 101, I covered things specifically related to what to eat to protect and support your liver. So for patients without cirrhosis, I actually covered some evidence-based foods to eat. These include black coffee, not the kind with sugar and whipped cream on it, but black coffee. And if you uh, remember, I said up to about three cups a day, but even up to six cups a day. Um, I encouraged actually to the reduction, in fact, the elimination, if possible, of sugar-sweetened beverages. And then the data was very strong in supporting a Mediterranean-style diet, a diet that was really forward in terms of nuts, monounsaturated fats, such as extra virgin olive oil, and also a diet that was really forward on the fresh vegetables, more so than dairy and fish as well, and minimizing the amount of meat and sweets. That's really the principle of a Mediterranean-style diet. Now, for patients with cirrhosis, what we covered was actually even more specific, more granular, and that was actually a very specific recommendation for eating lots of protein. 0.5 to 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So for example, if you are 150 pounds, that really simply comes into a minimum threshold of 75 grams of protein per day as a minimum threshold, but, but even higher is better. We also emphasize that for patients with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, uh, getting in enough calories was critical. 15 kilocalories per pound of body weight per day for those people who are not obese. And then we talked in Nutrition 101 about different thresholds or different changes in the kilocalorie uh, threshold if uh, you're also trying to lose weight at the same time, but also emphasizing that if you're going to reduce your total calorie intake, you are not going, you are not supposed to, you were supposed to still maintain the protein threshold. Uh, low salt diet is probably something that all patients with cirrhosis have heard, so achieving less than 2,000 milligrams per day of sodium, and then the essential um, protective effect of a high protein or and high energy snack at night, about a 200 kilocalorie at night to prevent these long periods of fasting that are so dangerous for patients with cirrhosis. But what I realized in my time of giving this talk and really disseminating information for patients, and after last year, I had other incredible opportunities to give uh, this talk to patients with PSC and with PBC and hepatitis B, just really great opportunities. What I realized is I could stand up here all day and tell you what to eat. I could give you very, we could get really granular into your diet. I could give you personalized, you know, menus and recipes, but if, what I am telling you, if coffee is and nuts are not the thing that, that are easy, are things that you currently do, that um, if it doesn't fit in with your lifestyle, if it's not fitting in with your habits, your preferences, your culture at this current time, then in fact what I'm telling you is, is really not going to translate into real life practice. Because in reality, nutrition and the application of nutrition as a therapeutic for patients with chronic liver disease is not just about what to eat, but it's also about how to eat. It's about how to translate these recommendations about what to eat into how. And so that's what I wanna to cover today in Nutrition 201. My specific objective is to offer you three principles to eating that will allow you to personalize nutrition as a therapeutic for your liver. A little bit more review from Nutrition 101 before I get into these three specific strategies, um, because this is just an essential principle. The nutritional strategies for patients with chronic liver disease differ by the stage of your liver disease. 
Now let's talk a bit about the stages of liver injury. So chronic liver disease, such as viral hepatitis or PSC, leads to inflammation, this chronic state of inflammation of the liver cells, which then leads to fibrosis, or it's just another word for scarring. And when the scarring builds up after a long period of time, your liver can become fully scarred and that's the state that we call cirrhosis. Now the liver is this beautiful organ that is able to preserve everything it needs to do, all of its liver function. It can continue to make proteins. It can continue to clear the toxins from your blood all the way up through these um, early and even quite advanced stages of fibrosis. But once the liver becomes fully cirrhotic, this is where the liver cells and the liver function become impaired. Nutrition and nutritional strategies really need to match up with liver function. So in these earlier to advanced stages, early advanced stages of uh, liver disease, the nutritional strategy should be targeted to protecting the liver. And then when the, the liver function is impaired or when it's cirrhotic, that's when the nutritional strategy needs to flip and actually become one about supporting your body's needs. So no, now we're no longer supporting the liver, we're no longer trying to just protect the liver, but actually because the liver cannot make energy and can't sort of synthesize the cholesterol and the protein, we actually have to use nutrition and what we take to fuel the body's muscles and the heart and the lung and most importantly, the brain. Today, in Nutrition 201, I'm really gonna be focusing on the protect your liver phase. Now that doesn't mean that the things that I'm going to address today do not apply to patients with cirrhosis, but I'm really going to be emphasizing uh, the earlier stages of liver disease uh, with Nutrition 201 Protect Your Liver Strategies. And you might be asking, well, what am I protecting it against? Who's the enemy? Well, the enemy is actually excess fat. Now you may be asking, well, why are you so obsessed with excess fat and why is this the enemy, um, the only enemy, when there are so many other enemies out there against the liver, so many other things that can damage the liver, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, autoimmune hepatitis, alcohol, iron, PBC, PSC. Some of you out there uh, who are patients may actually have one of these conditions and are here specifically because you have one of those chronic liver diseases and you wanna learn about strategies to protect the liver. Well, you may also know that the liver community and the science is advanced such that we have a number of therapeutics and therapeutic strategies to help protect your liver against these external forces. We have antivirals, we have immunosuppression, we can remove the toxins, and we have ursodiol as well. So we have a lot of therapeutic strategies that are actually quite effective. But the problem is, no matter how effective these therapeutic strategies are, you can see here from this figure that they do not protect your liver from fat. And in fact, some of you out there may be here because your doctor has told you that your liver has excess fat. And if you have another chronic liver disease, your liver is still vulnerable to excess fat, but I, what I think is most scary is that even if you don't have another chronic liver disease, if you don't have viral hepatitis, if you don't have autoimmune hepatitis, if you don't have PBC or PSC, we are all, every single one of us in this room is vulnerable to this enemy of excess fat. And in fact, one in four people in the United States have a diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This doesn't even cover the people who have not yet been diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and given the epidemiology of obesity in the United States and really in the world, this number is only going to increase. And so if you want to, if you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and you wanna reduce your amount of fat, or if you wanna prevent 
yourself from being in this arrow if you, um, if you aren't already diagnosed, if you haven't already been diagnosed with NAFLD, I have a therapeutic for you, and that is nutrition. This is where nutrition falls in our therapeutic strategies, in our arsenal of things that we have to protect your liver because the data have shown that nutrition can actually make the fat go away. But if we're going to understand how we can leverage nutrition to make the fat go away, we first have to understand, well, how does the fat get in there in the first place? And here I want to take you to a little bit of mini, mini medical school and do one slide on mechanism. I promise it's only one slide and we'll get to the more interesting stuff. And I want to just cover liver lipidology, just some really basics, okay? There are three, in the simplest of forms, there are three main mechanisms of liver fat regulation. The first is within this first row, and it's really the input. It starts, this whole cycle of liver fat really starts with this, um, this state of excess calorie intake. Now, it's just, it's calories, not just fat, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. We'll get into the details. Um, and, and it's when your liver has already stored up some calories as glycogen. That's kind of the immediate fuel source. And now it says, okay, I have enough. What do I do with these excess calories? And it starts to shuttle them into fatty acids. Excess calories, as we all know, also leads to a state of obesity, and obesity um, really implies that there's actually a, a excess adipose tissue, so excess fat tissue in the body, and that leads to this chronic cycle of excess circulating fatty acids, because the, the fat is not just fully stored in the liver, there's just a constant state of, of background breakdown, and so that back, background breakdown of the adipose tissue in your body leads to excess fatty acids in the blood, and that all blood gets filtered through the liver, and so the liver starts seeing these excess fatty acids. Okay, so what happens when it sees excess fatty acids, and what happens actually when it sees sugar? It actually goes into the state of de novo lipogenesis. De novo lipogenesis is just a fancy way of saying it makes new fat. And where is the first place that fat gets stored? Fat will first get stored in the liver, and in fact, the liver is a very efficient place to store the liver because the liver cells, it doesn't have to really be transported or exported. The liver cells just make the fat and then just sort of store, store it outside and it gets stuck in the liver first. And then there's this process of export. You know, part of it is when the liver starts, the liver cells see a lot of fatty acids. Um, it actually will say, okay, well, I have kind of enough. Um, my body's in this state of excess. And it will actually package some of these fatty acids into it, triglycerides and then into these lipoproteins called VLDLs, which ultimately, um, long story short, get broken down into the LDLs, the HDLs, the triglycerides that you see on your laboratory reports. And so that's why oftentimes, uh, and if you're a patient with fatty liver disease, you may actually have noticed that a lot of the, the sort of the fat in the liver actually corresponds with um, the HDL, the LDL, the triglycerides um, in your blood report. And that's why a lot of liver specialists um, are measuring uh, the, the sort of blood cholesterol in patients who have no, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there's not much that we can do about the rate of export, you know, the, the packaging is going to happen sort of at this baseline rate no matter what. But I think you can see once you understand the basics of liver lipidology or the study of fat in the liver, how nutrition can play a role. We can think about um, excess calories, we can think about kind of not stimulating this de novo lipogenesis, this cycle of de novo lipogenesis or new fat production through nutritional strategies. And it's almost as simple as that. In fact, you don't need a hepatologist or a biochemist to actually know what to do to make, to, let, to, let, to make nutrition a therapeutic for your liver. It's just eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I couldn't have said it better than the food writer Michael Pollan. So that's it. It's, it's that simple. But if it were really, in reality, that simple, then why are we seeing increasing rates of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Why are we seeing one in four Americans who currently have a diagnosis of fatty liver disease? It's because 
it's not that simple. You can't just tell people what to eat. You also have to tell them what to eat. And I think one of the challenges with nutrition is that we tend to see things in black and white. We tend to think of things, and we tend to think of ourselves even, as healthy or unhealthy. You know, you go out and you have a big you splurge because you're out with friends and you ate this big meal and you just feel, oh my God, that was so unhealthy. I'm so unhealthy. And, and, and you sort of just feel like, I give up. You know, how, how, there, there's nothing I can do. I sort of blew it yesterday. And then the next day you just say, okay, I blew it. You know, what's the point? I'm unhealthy. But the liver is actually an extremely resilient organ. And the, the truth is that there is really no single food or no single behavior or no single dinner that's going to blow it for your liver, with rare exceptions, right? I mean, we know there's that poisonous mushroom out there. If you eat the poisonous mushroom, that will, that will damage your liver. But with those very, very rare exceptions, your liver has a lot of ability to take damage, a lot of damage or a lot of these quote unquote unhealthy foods. And so I think it's actually much more productive for us to think in terms of a spectrum. I, I almost want us to take out this sort of healthy word and replace it with healthier. It's just this constant kind of trying, we're trying to shift towards healthier, right? Everything we do, everything we eat, just think about how can we get more to this right side of healthier. And along those lines, this is where the three strategies from Nutrition 201 are gonna come in. I wanna offer you three dimensions to think about healthier. The first is think about moving from physically full to satiated. The second is to move from ultra-processed to whole, and the third is to move from uni food uniformity to food or dietary diversity. I'm gonna cover these three strategies right now. So let's start with physically, from moving from physically full to satiated. So there are a number of factors that contribute to satiation. I think you might, some of you who are really into this stuff probably have heard about this, you know, mindfulness, being in the moment of that food, enjoying the look, the smell, the taste of the food, um, enjoying the environment, the company you're in, or the, the, the restaurant, or sort of the, the, your patio that you're sitting in, and the nice weather, or, or this, this sense like, I'm good, I feel good um, when you're eating. But, as someone who gets who gets who really geeks out in nutrition science, what I really want to tell you about is PYY. So PYY is actually a super cool cool hormone called peptide. Uh, it stands for peptide tyrosine tyrosine, and it is one of the family of satiety hormones. Now I just chose PYY, but you, you might have heard of GLP-1. Um, you might have heard of leptin. There's some other some reasons I I didn't mention those two, um, but. PYY is in that same family, but it's probably the one you, you might not have heard of. And PYY is released by the gut in response to food. Studies have shown that it's really strongly res um, released in response to fat and protein, much more than carbohydrates, interestingly enough. So of note, those pretzels that you ate probably is not stimulating PYY to the same extent as nuts, for example, that are pretty high in fat. Um, but the studies have also shown that it probably is, it's probably um, stimulated in response to stomach distension. So some of that early distension um, as you start filling up, PYY is also released, even though it's released in, by the distal, uh, it's kind of in the lower part of the intestines. The key to P understanding that PYY, as well as kind of all the satiety hormones, is that it takes 15 to 20 minutes from release of PYY to get to the brain to then tell you I'm good and to suppress your appetite. And so when you understand this kind of basics of nutrition hormones and endocrinology, there's an obvious answer here, and that is to slow down. And there was recently a very cool study in which they randomized 21 participants to uh, normal eating versus a slow eating group. And this was 600 kilocalories. Think, think to your breakfast, and you probably had about 600 kilocalories. Um, and I just, as I go through these data, I want you to think, how many minutes did I spend eating that breakfast? 
And what they found in the slow eating group was that these individuals had higher levels of PYY. Remember, this is a satiety hormone. So the higher the PYY levels, the more satiated that person was and, and the, le the lower their appetite for food. They also had lower ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is the grr, I'm hungry. It's the hormone, the hormone, uh, the hunger hormone. And at two hours after this meal, they reported greater levels of, of fullness. They just felt, oh, I'm still not feeling satisfied at two hours. And then at three hours after the meal, they offered, these investigators offered the, the participants a snack. And they said, okay, go ahead, just have at it. And in fact, the slower eating group actually ate 25% fewer calories for a snack because they were more satiated because this PYY was um, in, still in the system. And then what was super cool was that they stuck these participants in an MRI, what F, this fMRI. FMRI is a functional MRI in which they kind of see where what's getting activated um, um, in, in real time. And the regions of the brain that govern satiety and reward were more activated in the slower eating group. Super cool. Now, you, now of course, you, your next question is, how slow is slow? What was this normal eating group? Six minutes versus 24 minutes. So six minutes, I'll bet, if, if you guys actually looked at how long you took to eat breakfast, I'll bet you that was probably how long you spent eating breakfast, was about six minutes. But 24 minutes, this is a perfect example of when you understand the science of nutrition and you design a study, 24 minutes is that kind of after about 15 to 20 minutes, PYY has been released, it's gotten to the brain, and, it's, and it reduces your appetite. This, 20, this experiment was not designed perfectly with understanding nutrition science. So what are some of the strategies that you can implement to try to slow down and kind of activate this nutrition science and implement it into your life? Well, to start, let's get a little bit of distension, so zero calorie distension of your stomach to see if we can activate some of these, um, these satiety hormones and get them released. So drink a glass of water before you start eating, okay? Let's do you know a six to eight ounce glass. Put your utensil down between bites. I think a lot of times we're scarfing down our food. That's a you know, common phrase. And you know, think about putting your utensils down, just resting in between bites of food. And then, oops, sorry. Um, don't eat while on the go because that, you know, now we're not, we're not even in the six minute group. If you're eating on the go, we're already getting into probably into just like two minutes to eat. So you know, that's, a good, that's another good strategy. Okay, let's move on to the second strategy is in which we shift from ultra-processed to whole. Ultra-processed is formally defined as industrial formulations, typically with five or more, and usually many ingredients, and they include food substances not commonly used in culinary preparations such as hydrolyzed protein, modified starches, and hydrogenated oils, and additives whose purpose is to imitate sensorial qualities of unprocessed or minimally processed foods, such as colorants, flavorings, non-sugar sweeteners. This is the formal definition of an ultra-processed foods. Now, ultra-processed foods do not stand alone. They actually stand on a spectrum of processing. So, Ultra process, and this is actually a, a, one of the most kind of well recognized uh, classifications. It's called the NOVA classification and has been endorsed formally by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So, ultra processed foods is kind of the extreme end of processing, as you can imagine. It's really characterized by many ingredients and food additives. And they include common foods uh, that we eat are cold cuts, soft drinks, ice cream, cereal, and hot dogs. Okay, then as we shift to the right, as we shift to healthier, um, there is the processed category. And so these are industrial products made using preservation methods such as canning, bottling, fermentation. They include bread, cheese, jam, and even tofu. Then we continue to move um, sort of up in the processing chain. And um, this is category two is processed culinary foods. 
obtained directly from foods in group one, which we'll discover, and created by industrial processes such as pressing, extracting, and refining. So this includes oil, salt, sugar, and butter. And then, as you can imagine, there's number one, which is unprocessed or minimally processed foods. These are the things that come from nature and you just pop into your mouth. Vegetables, fruits, nuts, uh, meat, and then there's the minimally processed. So there's, you know, I guess meat is sort of minimally processed. There's milk, um, and there's also eggs. And so so as you can see very clearly here that we're shifting to the right. Remember, this is the theme, is the spectrum. Um, and you move from ultra-processed to minimally processed, and that actually is a healthier choice. Studies have shown, um, actually now a number of studies at this point, that ultra-processed food consumption is associated with greater severity of fatty liver disease. In the study of 800 patients who filled out a food frequency questionnaire and also got a non-invasive test for fatty liver disease and fibrosis, the studies showed that rates of NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is sort of the inflammatory um, version of the spectrum of fatty liver disease and much more damaging, the rates you can see um, in, the, in the lighter gray bar on the right, the rates of NASH among those who had fat in their liver were much higher in uh, the patients who had a high rate of consumption of ultra-processed foods. And then the rates of um, fibrosis, so scarring, that's what we're really scared about when we have fat in our liver. Uh, the rates of scarring were much higher on the, uh, in each of the pink boxes, you can see the lighter gray bar on the right um, was much higher in uh, those who ate ultra processed foods. Now I want you to look at the second pink box, the one in the middle. Those patients are the total sample. So a lot of these patients did not have known fatty liver disease. And what's super scary is they didn't have known fatty liver disease, but they they still have higher rates of fibrosis when they eat ultra-processed foods. So, you know, again, just going to this idea that ultra-processed foods are something that we, we need to be aware of and we need to sort of think about reducing. Here are some examples of ultra-processed foods and what can we do when we're faced with a table of snacks full of this. Let's think of some strategies. Try to eat from a bowl, not a bag. I think we're used to these single serving sizes, so we eat those directly from the bag, but then we translate that strategy of the single serving bag of, of food, and then we do it when we buy a big bag of food and we're still eating directly from the bag, and that's really a, a setup for eating too much. Shop the perimeter. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but the way food distribution chains are, are um, designed in the supermarket, things like um, all the fresh stuff that need to be brought in very frequently are actually at the outside of the supermarket simply because they don't want the delivery people to have to walk so far into the supermarket that takes a long time. And so that's why, for example, milk and dairy is kind of in the back, which is can be delivered directly um, on a daily basis or, or a couple times a week. So shop the perimeter because that's where the, the more whole and unprocessed processed foods are going to be. Um, you might ask yourself, um, would my great-grandmother recognize this food? I really don't know that my great-grandmother would recognize this thing. But I think perhaps even more importantly, some of this stuff, can I recognize where this food came from? I mean, I love cheese puffs, don't get me wrong, but when I was putting the slide together, I thought, you know what, I have no idea what is in the cheese puff. I really honestly, if you read the ingredients, you won't recognize 90% of them, and it's kind of frightening. So, of course, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back to here. Of course, our life is full of ultra-processed foods. So I think it's actually, again, not that helpful to say, avoid ultra-processed foods. They're all over, they are convenient, they're delicious, there is a reason why we eat them, and it, 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 there's no way that we can not eat ultra-processed foods. And so among ultra-processed foods, is there a strategy that we can try to pick, you know, move to the right, move to the healthier among ultra-processed foods? And I want to bring in this concept of an added sugar. So if we're going to understand added sugars, we first need to understand total sugar. So total sugar includes sugar naturally present in many nutritious foods and drinks, such as fruit and milk, those have sugars in them, as well as any added sugars that may be present in the product. Added sugars are sugars added during the processing of foods, such as sucrose, so just your table sugar, packaged sweeteners, such as sugar and artificial sweeteners, as well as syrups and honey, I know that the, the whole hot craze right now is agave, but that is an added sugar too. It's not healthier than table sugar. And then concentrated fruit juices. So these are what added sugars are. 
The daily value as determined by the Food and Drug Administration is 50 grams. I put this in quotes because the idea of daily value is a little bit ridiculous when it comes to added sugars. The daily, the recommended daily value of sh added sugar should be zero. There is no value to an added sugar, but the, re the reason I actually put this up here and the reason I find it helpful is we can't avoid added sugar. I mean, unless you, live on a farm and are sort of eating directly from, from, your, from the, your farm, it's pretty hard to avoid added sugars. And so starting at some point, some metric at 50 grams is a good place to start. I challenge you to look at your food today and try to calculate how much sugar. I am pretty certain it's over 50 grams. Um, if you're already under 50 grams, that's amazing. But I will also let you know the American Heart Association has reduced this dramatically. I think it's about 25 for women and 35 for men. So it's half this for the, um, as recommended by the American Heart Association. So this is just a place to start, but your ultimate goal, the shift to the right, is actually closer to you know, single digits, if possible. It's very difficult. So added sugars are not good, and there are so much data both in um, rat models as well as in humans um, that, that really describe the perils of added sugar. Added sugar frequently comes in the form of fructose and high fructose corn syrup that are found in ultra processed foods. So really added sugar and ultra processed foods go hand in hand. It's what makes ultra processed foods so tasty, but it's also what makes ultra processed foods full of excess calories. And so it's super easy to sort of eat way too many calories with ultra-processed foods. Um, this, this added sugar in the form of fructose is particularly bad. We, there are lots of, there's a lot of science that shows that fructose stimulates de novo lipogenesis. So remember that is the production of new fat um, that also, that gets into the body but gets stored in the liver. But it's interesting, fructose also does another thing and it blocks fatty acid breakdown in the liver. And so now fatty acid breakdown, you need to break it down so that you don't have fat anymore and you need to utilize it for energy. But the, the presence of fructose actually stimulates the liver to stop breaking down that fatty acid and to actually then package it in, into a storage form and to keep the fat. And then this is actually probably something we'll end up getting into in Nutrition 301, and it's a little bit more advanced. But the process of breaking down fructose actually yields uric acid. Uric acid is super inflammatory. It's super inflammatory in the liver, but it's super inflammatory in the body. Um, uric acid, as some of you may recognize, is the thing that causes gout. And so, you know, gout, high levels of uric acid, high levels of gout actually are, are sort of, are, are not uncommon in patients with obesity and, and, and also, as a result, patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So um, it's, this is not a good byproduct of fructose breakdown so there's a very obvious strategy actually to, to focus when you focus on added sugar. So the FDA actually did, uh, required in 2016 and, and fully implemented by uh, 2020, you'll, you'll see now all foods with labels. First of all, if it has a label, it's probably on the more processed side. Um, but um, all labeled foods, packaged foods actually now have this added sugar line. So. Um, I wouldn't look at total sugars, I would actually look at added sugar. Because if you look at total sugars, honestly an orange has total, sh orange has sugar, right? And, but, but none of it is added sugar, so go for the orange. What I'm worried about is this added sugar. And this food in particular is super bad because of the sugars in this food, all of them are added. 23 of the 25 grams are added. Um, don't look at that percentage percentage because again that's like percentage of your daily value but again the daily value should be zero so really focus on this added sugar column try to get that under 50 and when you're at 50 pretty consistently start shifting that downwards okay so the last uh, spectrum of healthier last dimension is going to be uniform or moving from food uniformity to food diversity so food diversity is defined as the number of different foods or food groups consumed over a given reference period. Uh, one study, actually I've only seen one study out there that looked at food diversity or dietary diversity in the setting of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or really even patients at all with uh, chronic liver disease. But it did show very clearly that patients who reported a greater dietary diversity 
uh, had a much lower risk of having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In fact, their risk was halved. Um, and so this is just one of what I think are going to be many studies that look at dietary diversity and, and the protective benefits of dietary diversity and food diversity in your diet. But I'll be perfectly honest, I, I find in the literature and also just implementing this concept of diversity into my patients' lives and into my own lives and my family's lives actually a little bit difficult. I mean, this number of different foods, um, I, I think there are a lot of ways to think about diversity, and I think food groups are not the, the only way. But let me just talk about the two ways. So um, I, what I can tell you is this is definitely not dietary diversity even though there are lots, they look quite different and there are lots of different shapes and lots of different colors, but all of them are unnatural. So this is all just, this is actually food uniformity in which all of the, all of the foods in your diet are ultra processed. So one way and, and, and kind of the, the way that it preserves the definition is to think about food groups. So if you'll recognize this from Nutrition 101, this is actually the, the pyramid of the Mediterranean style diet. You'll see that at the bottom there's the whole grains um, and there's oil, and um, so different oils. Okay, then you go up and you see fruits and vegetables. So those are all different fruits, vegetables, whole grains, oil. Those are all different food groups. And then you go up and you see some beans and legumes and um, you see some nuts. Those are all three different food groups. You go up, you see some dairy and you see um, seafood, two different food groups. And then you go up and you see um, the meat. Okay, and so these are all different food groups. If you got all of these on a plate in one meal, that is a super diver, di that is achieving di dietary diversity. What I love, and, and I do this with my own children, actually my whole family, because we have a great time um, eating the rainbow. And it's not eating the rainbow like that first picture of ultra processed foods, it's eating the natural rainbow. Um, and so you can see that there are so many different, um, different fruits and vegetables within each color group. We actually struggle most with purple. I'll tell you that's always a conversation of the dinner table. Um, so purple and blue. Um, but I encourage you that when you go to the supermarket next and when you shop the perimeter, I encourage you to pick up one new natural color that you haven't had before, you haven't had in a long time. And, you know, I think a lot of us are accustomed to eating the same um, foods and getting the same, you know, we have a shopping list and then we have the same thing on the shopping list, but just add one thing from that perimeter, from the produce that's a different color um, that you haven't tried before. And so that is my take on strategies uh, to leverage nutrition for your liver health and to protect your liver. Over the course of the last 40 minutes, we have talked about slowing down our meals, eating to satiation, not fullness, choosing more un to minimally processed foods along the, the processed food spectrum, and then increasing food diversity through food groups, eating the rainbow, and trying natural colors. And remember that achieving nutrition uh, as a therapeutic strategy for your liver health is always a spectrum. It's not healthy or unhealthy. You, it's not that you did it or you didn't do it. It's always that we should be constantly trying to shift to the right. And here are three spectrums or three dimensions that you can think of shifting. Now, of course, like any lecture, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I want you to look at this and I want you to see which dimension actually resonates with you. We have, you know, depending on when you're going to eat, your next meal is probably going to be lunch. And I want you to sort of, sort of um, announce, I want you to name what you're going to do. Where are you on that, spec on that dimension that you decided? And what is the action that you're going to take and implement into your lunch? For me, um, I know what restaurant I'm going to for lunch. I'm actually going to go, I'm choosing the processed one. I'm going to try to eat a, a, full, a fully whole um, and fully uh, minimally processed uh, lunch. Um, it's going to be a, a Greek salad, actually. And um, so that's my spectrum, but I, want you, I challenge you to try to move to the right for your next meal today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. We do have some time if anybody wants to approach a mic and ask a question. Just introduce who you are so we all. 
Uh, I'm Nali from uh, Ohio State University. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lai. I uh, always enjoy your talk. Um, so uh, just uh, because I see a lot of patients with uh, uh, for the NASH, this is why I'm kind of like very interested in this topic. Uh, clinically, it's a, it's always a challenging in terms of how to educate the uh, the patient, and often that the uh, uh, you give like the uh, like the uh, that education or coaching uh, in terms of the, the way eating and often patients says, uh, okay, I've tried all this and um, so that the, but it does not work. Um, so it's kind of like, I know that's uh, probably not a, uh, uh, often it's not actually a true statement because of like they, they just kind of like get frustrated as you said. Uh, sometimes they just kind of like give up and it's, the, it's not like a, uh, they will be consistently uh, doing the healthier um, the diet. So what is your general approach in terms of the education and teaching where they go from there? Yeah, no, I think that's um, a really, it's, it's the reality of our practice for sure. But I think you, you, you said it yourself right there that it's, it, when a patient comes in and says, I've tried it, it's not working, that is considering nutrition as a dichotomous healthy versus unhealthy, right? And it's, it's not this sort of consistent, I'm working towards all con consistently being healthier. I think the key to nutrition uh, um, and implementing nutrition is that it really is about behavior, that it is about um, a achieving consistently healthier behavior all sort of um, more and more and that there's no specific diet so you know i think what what happens is patients say well i'm going to eat only mediterranean food i'm only going to eat olives and hummus and olive oil all the time and then they they don't and they say that didn't work right but it but it's that it, every single time that they approach the 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 food table that they're thinking okay did i try to get you know, reduce my minimum, reduce my ultra processed foods, reduce my added sugar, sort of, you know, reduce my caloric intake. And so I think that that's a sort of, it's almost like a motivational or sort of behavioral coaching more than nutrition coaching and to try to get into that kind of framework um, with the patient. Uh, hey, Jen. Um, Nick Capilla from Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Uh, great talk, um, enlightening and amazing. Um, the first point, you know, slowing down, I think we can tell a lot of our patients, but the other two points, I get a lot of pushback on cost, and mm -hmm. it's expensive to eat healthy. How do you how do you approach that? Yeah, um, I get that a lot as well, and it, I mean it's a real concern for sure. Um, one of the reasons ultra processed foods have really taken off is because they're cheaper, um, and that's why they add fructose and high fructose corn syrup because it's a cheap way to sweeten foods and make them really delicious. Um, but if you, I, I get this question a lot, so I actually looked at my meals and I costed them out. And they're actually not, they're not more expensive. Or, you know, if you're thoughtful about it, um, and, and so I think that's a misperception. Um, for example, uh, one of my favorite family meals is actually a small bowl of rice. I'm Chinese, so we eat rice a lot. Um, small bowl of rice, uh, roasted broccoli. I buy those $5 bags of broccoli. Um, so $5 bag, and I actually only, we only eat about three quarters where we roast it with olive oil, and um, we put wheat fried egg, right? Honestly, I costed that out, $10, family of four, $2.50 a person. I challenge you to go to a fast food restaurant and get a cheaper meal than that. Dried beans in a bag, $2.99. I can do three meals with, the, with those dried beans. Super easy in a slow cooker um, in the morning. $2.99, three meals, again, I mean, there's no fast food that's cheaper than that. So this is sort of an education. The other thing with produce, produce is, is a challenge. You know, I think food banks also have a ch challenge with the expense of produce. Don't get me wrong, of course it's cheaper, but I, I, you know, I mean, of course it's more expensive, but um, produce needs to be purchased seasonally, right? It, it's, the, it's the importing, it's the demand for blueberries <laughs> from Peru, that's what's making it cost so much. But if we actually ate more seasonally, striving for more local, um, we could actually reduce the cost. And then also, I, I go, I, I mean, I live in California, so I know I have access to sort of more food, mar food you know, local produce and, and, and farmer's markets, but that's a way to sort of reduce the cost. Um, there are 
other ways to get the ugly produce, so go to supermarkets that, that sort of um, do a little bit of higher turnover produce or the ugly produce that don't look shiny, the apples aren't shiny, might have a bruise, but are still perfectly delicious and, and perfectly on the healthier side. Um, so this is more, going to the other, you know, our first question is, is this is really an education um, issue. <coughs> oh, the other thing, um, frozen vegetables have gotten such a bad rap. There's nothing wrong with frozen vegetables at all. There's nothing wrong with frozen berries at all. Um, actually, my kids eat frozen berries from the freezer. They like frozen, frozen um, fruits. So um, frozen vegetables are a perfect way to get whole foods, you know, or sort of minimally processed foods um, onto the dinner plate and in a cost-effective way. Hi, T. Borkers go from Al Cornell. And again, really, to echo the words, beautiful talk, both for patients and physicians, all of us. Um, I guess the point actually that touches on several of those things of how to help people change and motivate that and culture. I think you brought that up. And actually, to jump on, I, I would be curious to almost ask the question that's not the reason I stepped up when you mentioned a bowl of rice, whether that's white or brown rice, not because of getting into it right or wrong. That's the thing, too. I think as physicians, at least people with knowledge, we often get into, we actually defeat the idea of the spectrum ourselves. We start saying, that's right, that's wrong. For um, various reasons, we do that. The question, I guess, to you is more, how do we help patients in the how to eat when they have a cultural background? And again, the white rice, brown rice maybe comes up. I've asked a lot of friends totally. of mine in science and medicine, they're like, brown rice, especially if they come from Asian background, they're like, yeah. <laughs> so just would be curious for your thoughts. Um, OK, so this is actually, th thank you for that question. The cultural eating habits is actually the reason I came up with this talk, because the first Nutrition 101 was about this Mediterranean style diet. And the first question that comes up from my Chinese family is, we're not, we don't eat olives. We don't eat this, you know. And, and so that just is not part of my usual Chinese diet. And so this idea of going to healthier along these three dimensions, that's the purpose of whatever your usual diet is, whatever your culture is, whatever your habit is, um, use these spectrums to help you choose the healthier option. Let's get really specific on rice because I have very strong feelings about rice. White rice is delicious. My Chinese kids are pretty into white rice. I tried to do the like sudden shift to brown rice um, because it has more fiber and a little, you know, that shell on the brown rice. It's actually less processed than white rice, kind of weirdly as it is, and even though it's more expensive. Um, and it, it has more fiber and it actually has more nutrients in that, in that shell of brown rice. And my, my kids revolted. I mean, they were screaming. They were like, we're not eating this brown rice. We want the white rice. I really like white rice. And you know what we did? I, 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 I started thinking about my own lectures about healthier, moving on a spectrum. And I said, well, why did I just do this white rice to brown rice shift? That was too sudden. And so we actually shifted. And right now, we're at the stage where we're at about 33% brown rice to white rice ratio. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, I mean, at the first, I, I was doing 10% brown rice. And now my kids actually prefer it. They prefer this ratio of brown rice to white rice. And slowly, we're going to move to you know, 50% before they know it. They'll be, you know, we'll be eating, um, maybe we'll be eating um, brown rice. But Remember, it's a spectrum. So it's OK if you eat white rice. It's OK if we go to a Chinese restaurant and we enjoy that very delicious fluffy bowl of jasmine rice. It's all about the spectrum. Because on top of that, we're going to choose you know, a, very, um, a, you know, a healthier stir fry option on top of that with fish instead of meat. And so you know, again, it's just the, thinking about the spectrum. This is the way to personalize dietary recommendations for your patients. Dr. Lai, I love your work. Um, I'm Donna Yvonne from the University of North Carolina, and I'm a health psychologist, and I've actually been doing like lifestyle coaching with patients with fatty liver and Nash Perfect. for like 10 you years. Be yeah. This talk next. So I love your work. Thank you. It just it, you you make it so simple, and your take-home points are, are fabulous. Um, a couple things that I run into with my patients after I kind of provide a lot of the education that you're talking about. Um, one thing, I, I'm hearing a little bit about the inter, intermittent fasting mm -hmm. um, used as a reason for kind of to skip breakfast mm -hmm. and to go straight into lunch. So I wonder if you might want to comment about that. Um, and number two, there's, a, there's an emphasis from the physicians uh, to the patient with this, you know, 5% to 10% body loss, mm -hmm. uh, uh, weight, body weight uh, loss. Um, and that can lead to more restrictive eating, rapid weight loss, yo-yo dieting, as opposed to, I think, what you're kind of talking about, food as medicine, mm -hmm. and, you, and maybe commenting about kind of weight loss versus just this focus on kind of 
you know, healthier eating. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh, thanks for these questions. Super interesting. Okay, first, intermittent fasting. Very simple, black and white. If a patient has cirrhosis, no intermittent fasting. Uh, fasting, the long extended fasting periods have clearly been shown to be very damaging. That's when the body, it, the liver can't make the protein, and so that's when the body is utilizing the the skeletal muscle protein um, for energy and breaking down skeletal, skeletal muscle, and we know the importance of sarcopenia and frailty as a very strong predictor of death in patients with cirrhosis. So patients with cirrhosis, absolutely no intermittent fasting. In fact, they need to do the opposite and eat frequent meals. Okay, for patients without cirrhosis, so earlier stage of disease, um, intermittent fasting has been studied, and in fact, all the sort of the fad diets have been studied, ketogenic diet, just a low fat, um, diet, a low, generally low carb diet versus intermittent fasting diet. And the studies have not shown a superiority of the intermittent fasting strategy over the other dietary strategies. What is clear is that when it comes to protecting the liver from inflammation and, and fat, what's clear is that just achieving a lower caloric diet is the way to go. So whatever works for the patient to achieve fewer calories than they're currently eating um, is the strategy that is the best strategy to achieve a healthier liver. Uh, now, for some patients, intermittent fasting is the, the, the way that works with their lifestyle, works with their habits um, for them to, to skip breakfast, and, and you know, they're therefore reducing their caloric intake hopefully by 400, you know, 400, 500 calories instead of making it up later on. So for some people, um, the, uh, that is the strategy. Full disclosure, I really like intermittent fasting for myself. And so um, I do, for, for some of my patients who are thinking about it, trying, trying it out, I actually encourage it if, um, to see if it works for them. Okay, so I, I think the best diet is really the diet. It, it, the best dietary strategy is the one that the patient will do, okay? Now, the second question was related to Oh, five to 10%. ten percent. Yes, yes, no. So that's. I mean, you could probably give this talk on sort of how to uh, achieving these goals. So there, there's the goal of the objective of five to ten percent body weight loss, but that is now sort of again going on the dichotomy. If you didn't achieve five percent weight loss, then everything has failed. Right, and so that's oftentimes very discouraging for patients. And so really focusing, I think, on the behavior, um, on trying to, to say, well, you know, the, the weight is the same, or you didn't lose weight, but did you achieve, you know, reduction in added sugars? Were you, you know, did you try to eat more meals with less meat in it? Did you, you know, I think those are ways to give positive reward to patients, to encourage them to keep trying to achieve um, healthier lifestyle. Now, here's the thing, though is that we can't ignore the weight. And I think it is an important data point to help, to help kind of design a strategy that might, or I guess to, to refine the, the, the nutrition strategy for patients, right? I mean, if, there's, if they walk in and they say, I'm doing the strategies you told me, I'm, achieving you know more you know less ultra processed foods less added sugar I'm, i i i think i'm eating less and and then the scale shows that they gain 10 pounds we can't ignore that fact right and that's not going to be good that's not the strategy that we we want to achieve better liver health and so it, it i don't want to ignore the data point but, but incorporating that into say, well, that's great that you, you have been achieving this dietary behavior, but a lot of times what people do um, when, when the weight actually increases is that instead of replacing foods, they added foods. So when they hear, oh, I'm supposed to eat the Mediterranean diet, they continue their same diet, and then they add nuts, and then they add olive oil, and then they, right, they add it on top of it, and they said, well, you said, eating nuts was healthy, and so they just added the extra 500 calories a day. And so, you know, th that weight, the, the sort of the scale would be helpful to, to then just say, okay, we need to dig deeper into um, how you're implementing this strategy. And then you find out, oh, I see, you didn't actually reduce the, the pretzel intake, you, you just added the nuts. Let's see if, you know, may maybe this, this nutritional strategy needs some refinement for your lifestyle. Great, any more questions from the group?
Wonderful. Thanks again, Dr. Lai, for another great, fantastic talk.